My name is Deborah Axelrod, and I am uh, the uh, Medical Director of Community Outreach and Education at NYU. We've run this program before. This is a very special program. We've got a lot of interesting people in the crowd, and we're gonna, I'm going to do some shout-outs, uh, but not right now. First, I want to just tell you what the, uh, what the, what the show is going to be. Uh, so what, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce our speakers, um, and then we're going to show uh, a, um, a small clip on, on um, just entering a, a doctor's office and what, what's the right way, what's the wrong way. And Liz, is, you know, Liz Margulies, you want to? Okay, so Liz is director of the LGBT Center. She's going to be a speaker, but she made this, this video, which is really important. Um, and I, I think that we can all learn from it. And so, but it's a little bit like Leave It to Beaver. It's, it's, did you want that? Yes. I love that music, by the way. I think we thought of it more as a 1950s instructional video. Yeah, right. <laughs> it reminds me of that. And, and then we have Dr. Bluban Langner, who is new to NYU, um, who's a surgeon who um, I, I work with um, on doing some of my, uh, my um, uh, She's made my breast cancer reconstruction, but she is also doing a lot of the trans pa patients right now. She's been recruited from Hopkins. And then we have Dr. Ramon Jacobs, who is also uh, a, a very strong force at NYU. From, uh, he came from UNC, and I'll be introducing him uh, in a little bit. Uh, but this program is, uh, is very important, and uh, NYU has a strong initiative in the LGBTQ community. And we will also introduce Joan Kelly, do you want to, she's a patient experience officer, and uh, Kevin Moore, who's our liaison officer. And so uh, we also, we have uh, some interesting things that we'll, we'll discuss in a few minutes. I was just thinking about how important it is to be able to talk about your sexuality and your sexual orientation and to be able to identify your gender to a physician. Um, it's, it's difficult, it probably is a, um, is a community that's very marginalized. So when you get diagnosed with cancer, it's amazing that you have so many challenges and then you have this on top of it. You can't speak to your doctor about it, there are so many barriers. And I then started thinking about uh, a movie that I saw called um, Southern Comfort, I know if anyone saw it. It was made in 2001. Uh, it was about uh, a man by the name of Robert Eads. And Robert Eads died at the age of 53. He was a trans man. He had had uh, two children. And after that, uh, divorced, um, got divorced, and then became involved with a psychotherapist, which is interesting. And they lived uh, from, he, he moved from Georgia to Florida, and he was told that he should leave his um, ovaries and his, and his uterus, and he was never screened. And he started to have vaginal bleeding and some abdominal pain, and he couldn't get anyone to listen to him. And this went on for a while until he was diagnosed in, um, he was diagnosed in Georgia. He finally found someone to treat him with uh, metastatic ovarian cancer, and he lived with this for three years, and and he succumbed to it. But it's a it's a wonderful documentary just to understand. Made in 2001 or 2000, something that I think we should all be cognizant of when we talk about barriers um, to health, and this is a, certainly a barrier to. Uh, um, to, to any kind of uh, cancer treatment or cancer diagnosis. He could have been diagnosed a lot earlier than that, uh, even with those warning signs. Um, and then one other thing I'd like to just say about, you know, our medical community. Um, so we'll, we'll see what's wrong with the medical community, but what's, we also have many people who are sensitive um, to the community, uh, the doctors and the nurses and um, our ancillary staff. But <clears throat> I would make a push because we ask in our practice what people's sexual preferences are, what their sexual orientation, although we just really do, you know, breast cancer. Uh, but I think it's important and uh, it's interesting because our electronic records have to get on the ball. Um, Liz is saying yes because Liz wrote the white paper, uh, which actually got published the past year, although this was uh, the National uh, Cancer Action Plan was in 2014, the LGBT 
led one. And so we still don't have that. Um, we still don't have SEER data or national cancer data that speaks to that, so we can't identify and then understand what the deficiencies are. Uh, so that, that is something that I know that these guys are taking the initiative at NYU on, but na nationally we, we need to do that. So we're going to play the video, and then uh, Liz will come up and speak, and then I think Ramon will come up. And, and then Rachel will come up, and I will do justice and introduce everyone uh, and give them their, um, their accolades. So, let's go. I'm really nervous about this appointment. I haven't been to a doctor in years. But finally, I have health insurance. I chose Dr. Miller because he is in my network, but I don't know anything about him. As a transgender woman of color, Vanessa Shepard has had mixed experiences with doctors and hospitals in the past. But it's the bad ones which stand out in her mind today. So she enters the office with trepidation. Immediately upon entering, she begins to scan the environment for clues. Will she be welcome here? Will she be safe? Do the posters reflect a diverse patient population? Is there a non-discrimination policy posted? No, there is not. Hi, my name is Vanessa Shepard. I have a 10 o'clock appointment with Dr. Miller. Looks like this is your first time here. Please fill out all the pages on this form. Bring it back to me when you're finished. Thank you. Intake forms are a powerful and early indicator of the safety and welcome LGBT people can expect in a healthcare setting. What am I supposed to do here? Do I have to lie or how truthful can I be? Name? <sighs> I'm just putting Vanessa. Sex? Only two choices? I hate this. I guess I have to check mail the sex of my insurance card. <sighs> Relationship status. With these options, I guess I have to choose only single. Thank you. Can I have your insurance card, please? I have to make a photocopy of it. You can have a seat and I'll call you. Would you come here, please? You gave me the wrong insurance card. This one says Robert Shepard. I used to go by Robert Shepard, but now I'm Vanessa Shepard. So Robert is your real name, and that's the one we're gonna have to use. Have a seat, the doctor will call you. <laughs> Mr. Shepard? Mr. Shepard? That's me. I called for Mr. Shepard. You are? I'm Vanessa Shepard. OK, uh, come in. Vanessa is humiliated. Now let's see how it could be done better. Vanessa scans the walls upon entering the waiting room and immediately spots a non-discrimination policy and, yes, it includes both gender identity and sexual orientation. A rainbow sticker, yes. Oh, and they have the advocate? Great. Hi, my name is Vanessa Shepard. I have a 10 o'clock appointment with Dr. Miller. Oh, it looks like this is your first time here. Please fill out all the pages on this form and bring it back to me when you're finished. Thank you. It's immediately clear that this intake form reflects a medical practice with a diverse clientele, and that the providers here want to know who their patients are. The form has a place for Vanessa to write her legal name and her preferred name. It has more than two sex options, and a place to indicate she's in a committed relationship. Well done. 
Thank you. Can I have your insurance card, please? I have to make a photocopy of it. Have a seat. The doctor will call you. Mr. Oh, excuse me. Ms. Shepard? Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Come on in. And now the appointment begins. These first interactions with the provider subtly indicate to LGBT patients whether they can be open or need to be guarded. Let's see what happens between Dr. Miller and Vanessa Shepard. Just to get started, I saw on your intake form that you did not check off when your last period was. Yes, I'm a trans woman and I don't get a period. Oh, so that means you've had the surgery then, right? No, I don't know what surgery you're referring to that would make me get a period. Okay, um, so you have sex with men, which would just mean that you're gay. No, I'm a woman of trans experience, and I identify as lesbian or bisexual. Uh, I have no experience treating patients like you. I really think you need to be seeing an endocrinologist and not me. Well, I only came in here because I've been coughing for three weeks. This is not going very well for Vanessa. Now let's see what an LGBT welcoming provider might do differently. Um, I see that on our intake form you checked off that you're transgender. Do you prefer to be called Ms. Shepard? Yes, I prefer to be uh, called female pronouns, please. Okay, great. So sorry I got it wrong in the waiting room. Thank you for your patience. Do you currently have a healthcare provider who's providing you with your hormonal treatment? I do go to a clinic, but it's really far away, so I was hoping that I could do everything today here with you. While I have experience with the LGBT patient population, I've never been the provider of hormones for a transgendered patient. That said, I think it won't be a problem. I've prescribed hormonal therapy to other patients, and as long as you're willing to be patient with me and we work together, I think that should be okay. The other thing before we get into what brought you in today is I always like to remind my patients how important it is to be tested for HIV. Can you tell me when the last time is that you were tested? Dr. Miller knows that transgender women of color have particularly high rates of HIV infection due to multiple barriers to care and discrimination and many HIV-positive women have never been tested. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, tell me what it is that brings you in to be seen today. Well, I've been coughing for three weeks. What a terrific doctor. This could be the beginning of a long relationship. As we've seen, a doctor's appointment is a complicated set of interactions with the environment, with forms, and with the healthcare staff. There are many places to get it wrong and many opportunities to do it right. I, I love it. I think it's great. Good job. And I, you know, I, I when I when I watched it, I really loved it. And I also love Me TV. So I think it's kind of like that throwback, you know, that retro thing. Exactly. So I, I get what you're trying to do. Um, but I, I think it's a learning experience for everyone. All, all of the medical professionals um, that just are not, you know, as knowledgeable, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to have a missed opportunity for cancer screening, and I say that as a cancer doctor, and I think it's really important. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Liz. Um, I think Liz is fabulous and committed, and I mean, she's all of everything that you would want as an advocate. Uh, she is the founder and executive director of the National LGBT Cancer Network. 
which is the only program in the U.S. that focuses exclusively on the needs of LGBT people with cancer and those at risk. Uh, she is a um, co-author of the white paper, as I said before, that was published last year on the National uh, Cancer Action Plan. Uh, based in New York City, the network focuses on education, training, advocacy, and support. They've developed a nationally recognized cultural competence uh, training curriculum for health and social service providers. And as a result of her work for the underserved community, Liz was chosen as one of the out 100 for her work in the LGBT community in 2014. Was that from the, um, from, from the panel that you served on? No, I think it was for everything. Just for being wonderful? Yeah. Okay, Miss Wonderful, then get up here and speak. <laughs> no, don't clap, make me earn it. First, make sure I'm good. Hi. Um, I also just want to add one thing, which is that the video that you saw is part of our training curriculum. And it works as well as it does for training healthcare providers because people can s that the humor and the the structure of it allows people to see like, whoops, we do it the bad way without having to feel ashamed because shame is not a good teaching tool, it shuts people down. So what I'm gonna talk about today is the kinds of things that happen to LGBT people before they ever set foot in NYU. And that these things are rarely discussed but they increase cancer risks and the risk for many other kinds of diseases. Um, I'm starting with this picture because it is, in my view, nearly June 12th, but June 12th is going to mark the one-year anniversary of the gay massacre at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, and I'm going to use that as a backdrop for discussing health disparities in this community. But first let me remind you, because I'm sure those of you who are not part of the community don't remember this well, there were 49 people killed and 53 were wounded that night, but LGBT math is different we were all wounded by what happened. And many people recovered, but the trauma can be set off again when there is another LGBT um, assault, a personal affront, or even something like what happened last night in London. And these things live within all of us, and it's part of what vicarious trauma is, and it's true for minority populations. This is where I usually start my, my talks about cancer. And I ask people a question. Is a tumor a tumor a tumor? Or does it matter who the tumor spent Valentine's Day with? And I want you to think about that for a second. OK, show of hands. Who thinks a tumor is a tumor is a tumor? Who thinks it matters who the tumor spent Valentine's Day with? OK, you guys got to vote. Everybody's to vote on one of these. <laughs> Okay, anybody want to re-vote for the first one now that you have a chance? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, what if it's an ovarian tumor and it's in a transgender man? Then does it matter, besides to the patient himself? And then, because this is my backdrop, if a Latino man is wheeled into the ER with gunshot wounds, does it matter whether he got them in a, a gang shootout or whether he was dancing with his boyfriend at the Pulse nightclub. I want to say that in every case it absolutely matters. Not because the surgeon will do anything different in his or her procedure, but it, it's important to know who needs to be there to hear the results, um, who's going to be taking this patient home to recover, and more what I'm going to focus on now, what kinds of experiences brought this person to this moment where they are entering the hospital. And I think we have all arrived from different places. And it's important to know where LGBT people have arrived from before that gunshot wound or, wound or that tumor. And the different places are obviously not geographic, that's just an image. Um, some people enter NYU with a lot of privilege, and some people enter having experienced a lot of discrimination, and some people have had privilege because they've hidden their identity, and so they were spared some discrimination. Um, some people come with their families beside them, and some enter NYU after decades of family rejection. So I'm gonna talk about all of these experiences that LGBT 
people in this country have that shape their health, including their risk for cancer, and some of the history that people have had engaging with the healthcare system before they ever have a cancer diagnosis. And these are what's called the social determinants of health. Whether you smoke cigarettes or are a vegetarian, whether your family has a history of cancer or you drink too much, these are about your personal risks. But I'm going to be talking about the social causes, the stress and stigma of living as sexual and gender minorities in this country that increased health disparities and cancer risks. So let's start with discrimination. Um, you may be surprised by this, but LGBT people are the greatest targets of hate crimes in this country. And I, don't, I think most people don't know that. Like if I asked you which group, I doubt you would have said LGBT. Um, this is from the New York Times. You can always tell the New York Times because they insist on putting a period between the L and the G and the B and the T. <laughs> Nobody else does. <laughs> so, that's, so you know I didn't make it up. Um, but I want you to know that LGBT people are twice as likely to be targeted as African Americans. Um, now, I'm calling these hate crimes, obviously, but I want to say that just last week, the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals ruled that anti-gay attacks cannot be prosecuted under the state's hate crime law. That's, that's wrong. Okay. Um, but the LGBT community is diverse, and discrimination is not distributed equally. We also, every single one of us, has multiple um, intersecting identities. Looking at this, you can see that trans women of color are at the greatest risk for being killed, most likely shot. And just so you don't think things have gotten that much better, 2016 was the deadliest year on record for trans murders. Um, I'll give you a second to read these. I have a sort of pet peeve. I don't read slides. You can read them faster than I can. Um, but I'll talk over your reading. Discrimination is not just unpleasant un or unfair. It has very serious health consequences. It compromises our immune system and raises our cortisol levels. It shows that discrimination leads very clearly and directly to health problems. And the last one's really unbelievable. And they, they um, looked at areas with um, anti high anti-gay bias and overlaid it with um, death records and found that LGBT people who lived in those places died 12 years sooner. Being LGBT takes 12 years from your life if you live there. Um, so, and the first one shows how policy can affect one's health that it doesn't even have to be a hate crime that happened just to you. Um, because as I was saying before, the um, consequences, the impact of these crimes ripple across the community. It not just focused on the individual or the group that was targeted, but there's a trauma response that is experienced by all members of the community. And this is exactly what hate crimes are meant to do. It's like terrorism. It's like last night in London. It says, remember, you are never safe. And that is the whole point of it. Um, oh, you can't. There's a lot of things under there that this is not. Yeah, just accept this line. But there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. It's just too vaguely gray. What'd you say? It's just going to go to the next slide. They're up. They're vague. They're, they're, it's subtle. It no, it so doesn't matter. Just take my word for it, OK? <laughs> we have things like job discrimination, job termination, eviction, loss of child custody, um, excommunicated from religious groups, et cetera, um, et cetera. Um, so what I'm going to be doing, and this was my first slide, is I want to look at certain subpopulations separately. So we're going to start, because of the last slide, with the trans community. And just the thing to know is that serious acts of discrimination have a major impact on people's health. Um, and in fact, they found that people who had ever experienced discrimination in healthcare were three times more likely to have postponed or delayed medical care in the last 12 months. So one bad experience um, 
has long-term consequences. And the thing for the providers who are out there in the audience to remember is that you carry the weight of every previous medical exchange or interaction that your patient has had. You might be the good guy or the good woman or the good non-binary person, but you are still carrying the weight of everything bad that ever happened to anybody. Um, and this statistic is absolutely true. It's actually only 19%, it's not actually 20%, have been denied coverage simply because they were trans. Um, I want to read a quote from a trans person here. Denial of health care by doctors is the most pressing problem for me. I have been denied care by doctors and major hospitals so much that I now only use urgent care physician assistance and never reveal my gender identity. And I think seeing Vanessa gives you a little sense of how that is. Remember how quick the doctor was to get rid of her and she only came for a cough. It was not really trans-related at all. Um, this is pretty amazing for trans people. 70% um, have had problems using public restrooms. Okay, this is another one of those where you might say unfair and not right, but where are the health consequences? It has health consequences because 59% are avoiding using public restrooms. It means how do you avoid using public restrooms all day? When you leave your house early in the morning, you don't drink any liquids. And 59% of the people are doing this, leading to the kinds of problems you see there on the right. And the, um, I think what this highlights is the final access to care problem, which is finding culturally competent providers. And I don't just mean doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants, or even social workers. I mean the MRI technician. I mean the triage nurse. I mean the person who takes your insurance information, who cleans your room. Every one of these is another encounter that if you are LGBT and inpatient or coming to um, the emergency room, increases your anxiety. Um, I'm just going to show this slide about family rejection and I want you to remember that 50%, that's one out of two trans people has experienced um, family rejection. I'm going to talk about the health consequences of that a little later when I talk about um, youth. This is my one slide about lesbians and this is from a large Harris Interactive poll. It was in 2005, but what's interesting about this group is that um, they were overly white, highly educated, middle class or upper middle class people were overrepresented in this group and 75% of them said that they delayed or avoided health care. The first two reasons were about cost and the second two reasons were about fear discrimination or previous discrimination in the health care environment. Um, that was a friend of mine. You can come in, Jackie. <laughs> um, now I want to talk about um, LGBT youth. Family acceptance or rejection, as I started to say before, is the most important variable in determining health outcomes for youth. Um, higher rates of family rejection by LGBT youth, ready for these? Six times more likely to be depressed than those who have not experienced family rejection over eight times more likely to attempt suicide, three times more likely to use illegal drugs, and three times more likely to have engaged in unprotected sexual intercourse compared to people who have family acceptance. So this, when you're speaking to youth, you wanna find out how their families have um, accepted them or not because it makes them vulnerable to many other health disparities. Family rejection also has an influence on access to care. So many people who are rejected by their families um, lose their health insurance. And they might not even be able to have transportation, this is not a very New York problem, to get to a health care facility. Now they can't get their own jobs and get their own health insurance because this is another shocking statistic. In New York, the average age that a lesbian or gay person becomes homeless is 14 and a half years old and the average age that a trans person becomes homeless is 13 and a half years old. The other problem is that when a uh, LGBT youth is rejected by his or their family, it's more hard for them to access care that requires parental consent. 
also when working with youth, remember that they may not be out to their family and they worry about the, um, the records being available and that their parents will find out. Um, so discrimination happens to trans youth and all LGBT youth in sex as well. I want to give you a few other important things. LGBT youth are um, over twice as likely to have had sexual intercourse before age 13. I'm not sure how much of that was forced or not. And here's a real, this one was really shocking to me. LGBT youth have much higher risk for pregnancy. Gay and bisexual men um, have four times the rate of pregnancy. They have caused four times more girls to get pregnant. And lesbian and bisexual girls are twice as likely to get pregnant than their um, heterosexual peers. Why do you think that is? Um, sometimes they don't listen. I'll give you three, three ideas. They're not really listening in sex ed because no one's really talking about their lives. Um, it was unwanted sex and they didn't have much choice. La, 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 I'm not really doing this, so I'm not really um, thinking about birth control. Or maybe I need to prove that I'm not lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and so I'm going to engage in sexual intercourse with someone of the opposite sex. And that's a really good reason, and it doesn't lead to careful planning, generally. Um, so th these are just a little handful Oh, there's a spacing problem because they're Mac slides on a PC, sorry. Um, taken individually, none of these seem very serious. But when you add these to the homelessness, the physical violence, the discrimination, the increased alcohol and tobacco use, you begin to see that the health of LGBT people is compromised starting in their youth. So what you see in adults did not begin there. The cancer risk behaviors did not start in adulthood. They almost always started in childhood. Um, so let's go back to Pulse for a second. What do you think it means that the youngest victim was 18 years old? I'm going to tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean he was there to get alcohol. He was there for safety. He was there because gay bars, yes, it encourages drinking. It's one of the few places that LGBT people can feel safe. That's why the Pulse Massacre was so terrible, because this was a sanctuary that had then been invaded. Um, now think about this. Some of the parents did not find out. They found out the same day that their child was gay and their child was dead, all in the same sentence. And some parents were relieved that their children were dead. They were not all treated well and not all welcomed. Their um, dead bodies were not all welcomed home. But we'll get to that later. OK, now I want to talk about LGBT elders for a second. Um, when I'm saying elders, I really mean this current generation of elders, because we have lots of reasons to believe that when people who are 30 now are older, that they will, there will be many differences. Because here you see that LGBT elders are far more likely to age alone without partners, without children. Now people are more likely to have children. It's a possibility rather than having had a child in a traditional heterosexual marriage and then coming out later. So remember this. So what this means is that our family of choice, the people who feel like our family, like my friend Jackie who came in, like we take care of each other, like you saw in the early years of the AIDS epidemic, that's what family of choice is. And the problem is that visitation policies and medical decision making laws often exclude families of choice. And you have to go through elaborate document making and maybe expensive document making to ensure that you can have people with you to help you make medical decisions and to be able to visit you. Yes, yes, I know after Janice Long Ben in Florida was denied the opportunity to say goodbye to her partner of 20 something years who had a stroke while they were at Disney World, President Obama said, you can have anybody visit you you want. And still there are many recorded incidents even in the last year of people being denied visitation. So marriage equality, that's fabulous. Not everybody's married. Not everybody is even married to their partner. And some people without partners have a tight-knit group of people, like we saw, LGBT elders especially, that they hold on to and support each other. 
This is just horrible, so I thought I'd put it up there. Um, just to keep this in mind, when you are working with an older LGBT person, that these things are 68% at verbal insults, that that's, means they're far more likely than not to have experienced that. Um, now this slide is to tell you, again, we're talking about who is older now, and I hope that this will change, but that most older people are not out to their healthcare provider. And that means that even if you're the good provider and you ask in the respectful way, it doesn't mean that the older person will feel comfortable revealing who he, she, or they are. It might take two or three times asking to make sure you really mean it. Because remember, you're carrying the burden of every negative healthcare experience this person in front of you has ever had. So discrimination impacts not just our physical health, but our mental health as well. Okay, I just want to tell you just a few other things about Pulse because this is, again, we're just about at the anniversary and I think it's really meaningful because of the uh, bombing in London last night. Adding insult to the nightmarish injury or injuries that there were that night, there was a need, a call out for blood donors. And men who had had sex with a man within the last 12 months were not allowed to donate blood. I want you to just think about that for a minute. People in long-term monogamous relationships and maybe even legally married, if their partner needed blood, their husband needed blood, they were not allowed to give it. They couldn't give blood to the family of choice. They could not help each other. Um, some of us went to the vigil in New York and people were sobbing here in New York. Some, yes, new people who had been killed in the Pulse Massacre, but it's vicarious trauma. Everybody experienced what it was like and the helplessness of those men, the survivors, being unable to give blood to the people who needed it. Um, just so you don't think that this is all behind us, this is from a 2015 study. Let me just tell you, in case, for those of you who don't know, that um, explicit bias is the bias I know I have, meaning 50% of the first year medical students in this study said, I would prefer not to work with LGBT patients if I had a choice. They just said that right out loud. Implicit bias is, is something that's unconscious and that people don't think they have. You know, the example I use is the, we ask the police officer, sorry if there are any police officers in the room, the white police officer, are you a racist? No, that's explicit bias. I'm not a racist. But when he pulls a black man over in his car and asks to see his license and registration, and the guy leans over to the um, glove compartment, and the police officer sees something metal and shiny in there, his immediate assumption is that it's a gun. It happens to, in my case, in my story, be the spoon that the guy uses to eat his yogurt every day on the way to work. Implicit bias makes you think it's a gun. And implicit bias is in effect all the time. Um, a man and woman walk into the breast cancer center and everybody assumes she's the patient. Well, he's maybe a trans man and he's the patient, but it's just a quick, um, immediate, unconscious kind of thing. Um, this is a slide I call, so given all that, why are we not all dead? And. Um, we're not all dead because of three protective factors here, and I actually used three pictures of three parades or marches for a very particular reason, because it's connection that saves us. It's being around each other. It's why people went to the Pulse nightclub. It's to be around each other. So the first one is communities of faith. Now, yes, communities of faith have been terrible, but some of them have also been great homes of um, acceptance for LGBT people, particularly people of color. The middle one is just the gay pride march, meaning being around other LGBT people has great protective factors against um, illness and uh, risky behavior. And the last one is PFLAG, which is the parents, friends, allies, blah, 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 of gay, lesbian, blah, 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 whatever they are. Um, because family acceptance, as I think I've now said, 
far too many times, um, is a great predictor of health. Okay, but here's an unprotective factor now that I said that about um, the communities of faith. Um, this person's, can you read that? This person's parents would not take him. He could not be, did not have a service at his church. Okay, so all of this is to say when we arrive at NYU as a 46 year old, I'm making that number up, it doesn't matter. Remember that if it's an LGBT person, he, she, them comes with all of these potential experiences of discrimination, sexual abuse, family rejection, um, homelessness, and suicide attempt, high alcohol and drug use, and to only look at the personal factors like smoking cigarettes. Smoking cigarettes is horrible, agreed. But smoking cigarettes is even linked to bullying, that those who are bullied take up tobacco use. So we need to look beyond the individual risk factors and look at the social determinants of health. And remember, we are afraid as we enter. We come with all of these histories, and you, it is your job to prove to us that it's safe to bring my whole self in. And you might need to prove it over and over again before it makes up for the people who are horrible to me. And then I just want you to remember that disclosure is not a one-time event. It happens over and over again. And you have to decide, as people in, we did a national survey of LGBT cancer survivors across the country, and people said, with every procedure, I had to weigh the anxiety, I had to add it to the anxiety of the procedure was the decision about whether to come out or not. And there are many people, I've asked um, cancer survivors, so cancer patients, how many providers do you have? How many people do you see? And people get up to 25 very easily. That's 25 decisions about whether to come out or not. It's exhausting, and each time it's related to safety. As one of the people in our survey said, I was out my whole life, but after I was diagnosed with cancer, I leapt back into the closet for fear that the homophobic doctor would leave some of my lesions behind or the homophobic nurse would make me wait longer for pain meds. I could not take the chance. The number of partnered people who left their partner's home through every meeting and every procedure Obviously, most of these people are not from New York, but this is, this is going on out there, and I want you to know. And this, I think, is my final slide, which is from our survey, looking at how people who came out, how did they do it? Now, we would like number one and number two to be the highest ranked ones. We want the form to do it. As you saw with Vanessa, before she even met anybody, the form turned her off. And we want to be asked, regardless of what the form says, I want, we want to be asked who we are, invited to bring our whole selves in. But sadly, sorry about the spacing, this is again, oh my god, the last number didn't even make it. I think it was 3%, the last number, as I recall. Um, I brought the subject up myself. And the people who brought the subject up themselves were overwhelmed, were, um, two thirds of them were coupled. Single people, they're not bringing it up. Why do couples bring it up? Because they have someone to go cry to if it goes poorly later, and they, and they give them moral support. And there's someone who's going to be really wounded if she or he is being left out. So that's the end of my um, depressing talk about what people bring before they enter NYU. Thank you.